and welcome to Classical Stuff You Should Know, a classical podcast put on by some classical guys. Yep. Yep. Hey, this is Thomas Magby, joined as always by AJ Hindenburg. That's me. And Graham Donaldson. A classical guy. Classical guy. You heard it here first. Hey, so uh, last week you heard uh, a story. It was story time with Donaldson. And you know what? It was such a fun time. We thought we'd have the guy back. Hey, Donaldson. Well, the funny it. thing is we opened that podcast about oh, with Wheel stuff about Wheel of Fortune, yeah. which we never actually talked about. So today I promise we are, we are, get to it this we are going to, even if I'm going to cut, so we're not going to get through the rest of the Plantagenets. We're going to get to... Uh, Edward Longshanks, Edward the First, the dreaded Hammer of the Scots. Mm. We will get to the beginning of his reign and then ar- and then cut it off there. And then we're going to talk about the Wheel of Fortune because that is initially what I wanted to talk about <laughs> last time, an hour and a half <laughs> ago, before we started this crazy train. Awesome. Um, Take it but, away, man. So yes. So if from last time where we ended, uh, Henry the Second. Uh, the uh, died, the king of England, one of the greatest kings of the English Plantagenet dynasty, of all the English dynasties, died. Um, the Last Lion in Winter is sort of uh, a really fantastic movie about his life, mm-hmm. starring Peter O'Toole as King Henry II and a young, um, shoot, um, I don't know. If you look at it, it's like all these like young British actors. Yeah, uh, I can't, uh, who plays Richard the First? I can't remember. But anyway, um, and uh, Catherine Hepburn, I think, is uh, is Eleanor of Aquitaine. Anyway, I've never seen it, but I've watched like clips of it, and it's fantastic. Um, so anyway, Henry II is dead. Um, his younger son, who was king, uh, died before um, he became king. If you remember, there was like the two kings. The co-kings that AJ <laughs> thought was the co- co-reigns. I very much no, misheard that one. The co-kings? Cocaine. Yes, you just said it. Okay, <laughs> yeah. just said it right there. Um, and now Richard is uh, the king, and he and his dad, towards the end of his father's uh, life, uh, fought. And when Henry the Second died, King Richard kind of was just—he did not show much sadness over the death of his father. He was sort of excited to be king, and. Um, so he was, whereas his brother who died was sort of like this hotshot boy of the party circuit and the tournament circuit, and everyone thought he was going to be a great king because of how awesome he was in, like, hand-to-hand combat. Um, that usually translates directly to good, <laughs> that's true. To good uh, Richard, statesmanship, yeah, right? Yeah. If I can hose a guy with a sword, I will know how to <laughs> rule a people. But Richard I had sort of cut his teeth putting down rebellions in Aquitaine. Um, he, commi- he was a, a military genius. He was not so much like the chivalrous man, mano a mano in the ring kind of ruler that his brother was, or was sort of what seemed he would have been if he had survived. But he was a leader of men, hmm. and people followed him implicitly. He just sort of had this personality, and he was an amazing military strategist. He had one ambition after he was king, and that was to go and uh, go on crusade in the Holy Land. So... Um, Richard was made king, and if you remember, Eleanor, his mom, was, Richard was her favorite. And she wasn't just his, the, the favorite because, for arbitrary reasons, there was this ancient prophecy that went back to Merlin, apparently. So Merlin was this, we don't really know what kind of figure he was, but there was this ancient prophecy, and Merlin's prophecy was this. Uh, let's see if you find it. Oh, yes. The eagle of the broken covenant will rejoice in her third nesting. What? What's, so there's this, What does that mean? So the eagle of the broken covenant will rejoice in her third nesting. People sort of took it to mean that there was going to be this eagle, a female eagle of England, who was going to be a powerful woman in the kingdom, who was going to... It was prophesied that her third child was going to be this chosen one. Oh. So, this was, it had been these prophecies that were floating around, but for whatever reason, Eleanor of Aquitaine strongly believed she that was. she was the eagle. And for good reason. Like, she was a pretty awesome uh, woman. She uh, uh, survived her husband. Remember, she got married to him, and she was a lot older, and she was a brilliant stateswoman. And, and a long, beak-like nose. <laughs> long, beak-like nose. That'll she could it. fly. Very wow. sharp eyes. <laughs> and she loved rabbit stew. Yeah, she loved All rabbit stew. Uh, anyway, so... In her mind, Richard was the eagle, was the, was the third nesting. He was the third king from, 
um, from her lifetime, her husband, her first son who died, and then um, Richard, who seemed to be a very co- uh, competent king. Anyway, um, he very much embraced this prophecy that he was like the second coming of King Arthur. Mm. He had a sword that was rumored to be like Arthur's Excalibur that he carried to the Holy Land to bring God's justice in the world, all this kind of How stuff. How do you not know if your sword is Excalibur? I feel like you should... Like, isn't it labeled? <laughs> oh, I, Does it say on the hill? Aren't there like, engravings or something? Like, be. if you get it from a lady in a lake, shouldn't it? Sure, but I mean, like, li- you remember, oh. so... In the stone, Arthur right? was that? probably Welsh, so he's in the northwest, and then the Anglo-Saxons kind of in, uh, said, no, he wasn't Welsh, he's actually one of us. And then the Normans came, and they're like, no, actually, he's not really Anglo-Saxon. He was probably Norman. Like, everyone sort of tr- <laughs> claims, uh, uh, claims Arthur for themselves. Oh, okay. So there's probably, like, a bunch of different Excaliburs out there. Oh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, wasn't Excalibur the one that came from the lake, not the one that yep. came from the What's stone? What's the one from the stone? Uh, the one that was there that just proved him to be a king. Yes, the Lady of the Lake gave Arthur Excalibur. Yeah, but, I wonder what they did with that sword afterwards. Gave it to Richard. I don't know. It was probably... Maybe. This year. Uh, <laughs> I, I have no idea. Anyway, so Richard becomes king. Um, and he swore a bunch of oaths, and we talked a little bit about how kings are, uh, um, are coronated before with the oil and the stripping down to the waist and making uh, great claims about being God's justice and God's righteousness on earth. The, uh, you, you, you read Moby Dick recently, right? Mm-hmm. So I love the passage in Moby Dick yeah, where you, it you, talks about... Did we talk about this you last time? You did talk about this last yeah. time. Oh, okay, yeah. Anointing the kings. Anointing the like like anointing anointing salad. Better. Yeah. Yep. Um, anyway, so... Uh, but... Th- the other th- the problem with these coronation ceremonies is that they are kind of tedious and long. All the bishops give these big old speeches about like the king's responsibility and he needs to lay down in front of the altar for like 10 minutes and everyone just sort of sits in 10 <laughs> minutes silence. So basically by the end of this ceremony Richard got really impatient and at one point um uh, after he had, had the, been cloaked with the royal vestments, uh, he went to the, the the pillow where the crown was, picked it up, Whoa. shoved it in the hands of the bishop, and was like, crown me already. Wow. And so the bishop was like, fine, and he crowned him. And then Richard basically pretty much almost right after, like, took off his royal vestments, put on his traveling clothes, and he's like, we're going to the Holy Land. We're going on crusade. Wow. Doesn't, right. that, doesn't that bode poorly for him as king, if that's how he is that he's a little That he's a little impatient? Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. I mean, Richard, yes, there are some things in Richard's reign that do not reflect very well on him, but there's also some things in his reign that reflect, like, flipping awesome on him. Mm. So well, I think, I mean, too much refer- reverence for tradition, wouldn't that kind of be dangerous for a king? I guess. I mean, people probably looked at his impatience as bad omens or, remember, the Plantagenets, hotheads, spawn of, spawn of Satan. and maybe the spawn of Satan. Yeah. So there's probably whisperings that he didn't want to be, that, you know, his blood was itching the longer <laughs> he was in church or whatever. <laughs> um, anyway. Oh, that's not good. not good. So for Richard to go to the Holy Land, he needed to do one thing, and that was talk to Philip II, the king of France, and basically hash out a deal that the king of France was not going to attack the kingdom while he was gone. If you took up the cross and became a crusader, the Pope basically said, if anybody attacks your kingdom while you're gone, I'm straight up excommunicating them. It was like, yeah, if, if you attacked the kingdom of somebody who was on a crusade, it doesn't matter if you win the kingdom, like, that, you're going to hell. Like, mm. you are, the, the Pope is going to come down like a ton of bricks on you. Wow. Um, but that also meant that kings would, like, take up the cross all the time, but then not go on crusade. they like, dither and dally, and they'd be like, yeah, I'll go on crusade next year. Or if there was enemies, you know, if there was a Christian king at your gate who was going to take over your kingdom, you'd be like, I'm going on a crusade! <laughs> and then they'd be like, ah, stink. <laughs> and, they couldn't, and then they couldn't take your town. Anyway. Are there stories of towns being invaded anyway? Like, do yes. Do people get there was. Yeah, they, they were, and there would be. And smaller, smaller lords and whatnot, for sure. Um, but anyway, Philip II and Richard hashed out this deal and to sweeten the deal, um, Richard promised that he would marry Philip's sister, Alice. Okay. Now, this is important because it had been wildly and widely rumored that Henry II, Richard's father, um, slept with Alice oh. and had this, like, long love affair with Alice. So, as an old man, Henry II uh, um, uh, had this love affair with Alice. This is, this is, and so, everyone kind of knew this and kind of laughed behind Richard's back that he was taking his father's mistress as his queen. Mm. And this really bothered Richard, but he kind of was in a rough place. He had to accept it, and he was going to marry Alice. Um, and, and then this was going to solidify the fact that Philip was not going to attack him when he was gone. So 
I wonder if, <clears throat> so back to the whole, like, if you were being attacked by somebody else, you'd be like, <laughs> I'm going on a crusade all of a sudden to get out of mm -hmm. the problem. I wonder if, like, if two rival lords ever played jokes on each other, like, I would attack your town, so you'd have to go on a crusade, <laughs> and then, ah, you have to go on a crusade, and I'm... I wonder if they ever mess with each other. Uh, I don't know about that, but I feel definitely, like that's something I would have done. But just attack his town, so he has to go on a crusade. Well, you are technically a lord, right? Yes. So you could do this, right? Uh, the the land. There's not a. Don't I mean, you, the other. You have lords, a square foot, don't you? I have a square foot, but I think if I attack someone else's square foot, they're not. <laughs> Henry, you may need to for the listeners out there who are confused. Mr. Arthur Lord Hannenberg is no sorry Arthur Arthur Jan Hannenberg is not Mr. He is actually a lord. lord. Yeah. So I when I started teaching, I wanted my students to call me Lord Hannenberg, and that went over okay for a while, and then they started calling the principal Dark Lord <laughs> Shoe, and that that went over <laughs> Did very not go well. Yeah, very poorly. Yeah. And and we're trying to teach our kids respect and stuff, and so yeah. I said, look, you can't make your kids call you a lord unless you're actually a lord. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I went and <laughs> tried to find. A, uh, a micronation, and micronations will occasionally sell lordships and knighthoods, and I found one called Sealand off the coast of Britain. Mm -hmm. And basically it's an old World War II fort that they turned into a pirate radio station and then declared independence <laughs> from everyone because they're in international waters. Yep. And then the criteria you have to meet to be a country, they claim they've met all three or four of them. Uh -huh. One is you have to like have diplomacy with other great nations and sort of that's through your recognition. Mm -hmm. And at one point, some Germans tried to, tried to come and take over the <laughs> fort. One shot was fired on accident when someone <laughs> dropped a shotgun. And then everyone was like, whoa, whoa, this is, this is getting serious. It's getting real. <laughs> but they kept the Germans prisoner. The Germans had surrendered. And so a diplomat came uh -oh. and talked, like, you know, sued for their release. Yeah. And so they claim that they are a sovereign nation. Silly. And I bought a lordship and a square foot of water. So they're, I am a principality, right? Principality of Sealand? Uh, I don't know. Anyway, so yeah, you are now Lord. I am Amber. I'm landed and titled. I'm, and so, I'm sorry we have not given you the due respect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And a little while ago, Britain expanded their borders to encapsulate Sealand. Sea -land. And so in retaliation, Sealand expanded their borders <laughs> to take up part of the British coast. And and Britain just <laughs> could not care less. <laughs> Good. But um but you purchased your title, yes, which yes, is I actually going to be a big problem in our story with, oh, really? with King John oh, coming well. up. Anyway, it'll, so. I mean, it'll be a problem for Sealand later when I start <laughs> coming and taking things over. Um, so Richard II is trying to tie up all the loose ends before he can go on crusading to the Holy Land. So he got Philip to agree not to attack him, but he's also got his younger brother John. And Prince John, as we remember, is he did not inspire confidence. Prince John was somebody who was... And we're um, talking Robin Hood Prince John. We're right talking now. Robin Hood Prince John. He was uh, weak, indecisive, mean-spirited. One of his chroniclers called him nature's enemy. <laughs> So he was just vindictive yeah. and petty. And, and so he didn't recycle? Uh, nature's <laughs> enemy, that's right. Uh, and, no, and just he sucked as a person, basically. Um, his father, Henry II, had given his son's land except for John. Even though Henry II loved John, he, didn't, he was the youngest, and he just, Henry didn't get around to giving him land before he died. Um, but he also didn't really trust John because John was basically a doofus. Um, and so he had the nickname Lackland because he didn't have any land. Um, so he was John Lackland and everybody made fun of him. And before he left, um, uh, Henry, or sorry, Richard was a little worried about his brother because he's going to be in the Holy Land. This guy is technically the heir to the throne because Richard doesn't have any kids yet. Um, and so he needs to uh, figure out what to do. John comes up to him and he's like, I want land. <laughs> um, and so Richard decides that he would give him a Norman title, lots of earldoms, and just to sort of appease him. But what this did was it did give John a pretty substantial power base. Mm -hmm. And it meant that John could raise armies if he wanted to. Um, uh, Richard essentially put John and John and a couple of other regents in charge of England and France while he was gone. Remember, the Plantagenet Empire was England, but a huge section of France. And as far as the Plantagenets were concerned, the huge section of France was like their meat and potatoes, and England was like a nice little bonus. Um, so when we think kings of England, we think, you know, the glorious island. But in the Plantagenet mind, the island was kind of like this gravy, mm. whereas France was their empire. France was their, their nation. Their, their, what we call France was their, um, was their uh, a kingdom. Anyway, so 
John and these other regents are in charge of England. We'll get back to them in a little bit. Um, but now we're going to continue Richard's story to the Holy Land. So uh, Richard goes off to the Holy Land, and as he's going, his mom comes along, or she sort of sends letters to Richard, and the big problem, the big sticking point was Alice. Richard doesn't want to marry Alice. He doesn't like her. Uh, everyone's laughing at him because his dad apparently was with Alice before Richard, and Richard just really hates Philip. Like, you know, they are not buddies. They do not like each other. So... Eleanor of Aquitaine uh, comes up with a plan. And so she gets a girl named uh, Bera... Oh, man, I can't remember how you pronounce her name. Let's see if I can find it here. Uh, I think it's uh, Berenjania. Berenjania. Um, she's, she is the princess of Navarra. Now, Navarra is in Spain. Mm-hmm. So she's the princess of Navarra. Let's just call her... Yeah, I think it's Berenjania. And... Um, she agrees to marry Richard in secret. Mm. So, Wait, what about Alice? Alice is, they're not married. They're engaged. And he doesn't want to marry And he Alice. does not want to marry Alice. But Philip, as far as Philip II is concerned, the king of England is going to marry his, daughter, his sister and everything's going to be fine. But what's the consequence of that? Um, angry Philip. Yeah, there Now, it is. meanwhile, uh, so while they're going on, Richard goes off to uh, uh, um, the Holy Land Philip decides he's going to go on crusade. Oh, okay. So Philip goes on crusade. So all these various kings are in the Holy Land, and they're stationed at this city called Acre. Um, Richard has a hard time getting to the Holy Land because of really bad weather, and Philip gets there first. Um, Richard has to sort of put up a port in Italy for a little bit. Um, and meanwhile, his mom is coming in this tiny boat with uh, the Princess of Navarra to marry Richard in secret. Mm. They get shipwrecked. Oh, uh, Eleanor and and the and the princess. They get shipwrecked and they land off the coast of Cyprus. And the Cyprian king f- finds Eleanor and the princess, and for whatever reason, decides that he's going to imprison them. So he imprisons Richard's mom like and really the princess. Bad idea. Yeah, and Does, Richard and he, finds out he, about he knows this. who they are. When he, he knows who that. they are. And then he sort of realizes, he's like, why is the Princess of Navarro with Eleanor of Aquitaine? And he realizes, oh, dang, she's coming to marry Richard. And so he imprisons the princess, hoping that by having this princess imprisoned, he can appeal to Philip II and say, hey, guess what? I've learned. Alice is not going to marry mm-hmm. Richard. Richard's going to marry this princess. Let's, you know, I can deliver this princess to you and you can have a one-up over Richard. But this doesn't happen because right. Richard finds out about this and goes ballistic, yeah. invades and conquers Cyprus. <laughs> so overall, a bad move. A bad move by the king of Cyprus. Yeah. So he, instead of going to the Holy Land, invades a Christian nation of Cyprus, Who? takes over. Well, the mm-hmm. Cyprian king wasn't on crusade. That's what I was going to so. ask. Was he the on? Cyprian king was not on not. crusade. Okay. Okay. So he frees his bride-to-be. Um and he captures the Cyprian king, and the Cyprian king is, is quite um, penitent, and he says, um, if you are going to capture me and parade me around, um, um, at least can you do it in a, um, like a noble way? So, like, don't, you know, like, strip me naked or anything. It's like, can you keep my dignity if you're going to parade me around? And so <laughs> Richard I says, fine, and he makes chains out of pure silver, and <laughs> makes him walk around uh, the capital of Cyprus in chains of pure silver. So I don't know if that's like a nice thing or kind <laughs> of like a, a dirtbag thing, uh, but Richard is ticked. Anyway, he marries the Princess of Navarra, whose name I can't pronounce, who I'm pretty sure is Berenjania, in Cyprus. And it just so happens that because they're in the Holy Land, all of these amazing bishops and nobility and uh, uh, lords from all sorts of different nations are in attendance. So this isn't like a tiny British wedding. This is all of the leading players of Christendom just happened to go to this wedding. Um, and, um, and it was apparently a very glorious affair. It was in one of the major cathedrals of the Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, um, uh, you have this Spanish princess, this red-haired, wrathful English king, um, and all of these lords and ladies of almost all of Christendom attending this wedding. It was a high affair, and Philip II is ticked <laughs> because Richard was supposed to marry his sister Alice, and he marries this, like, random Spanish princess. Anyway, so he's mad. 
Um, and now Richard's like, all right, now that I'm married and now that I've like ticked off R- Philip II, which is always a bonus, now I'm going to go and I'm going to conquer the Holy Land. So um, uh, he gets, so the, he arrives at uh, a big siege at the city of Acre in 1191. So that's the years that we're in. Uh, 1191, he arrives there. And um, what was famous about this battle was that the Muslims held the city and the French uh, were besieging it, and there were two giant catapults that were basically decimating each other. And those, these catap- the French had named these catapults. The French catapult was Malvoisine, which means bad neighbor, <laughs> which is hilarious. That's a good name. And uh, the Muslim catapult was Malcousine, which means bad cousin. <laughs> So there were these two catapults, and they were, like, flinging rocks at each other over and over and over, and no headway was coming. It was a terrible, terrible slaughter. Thousands of soldiers—not thousands, but, like, many, many, many soldiers, probably thousands, on both sides were slaughtered. There was this huge moat that the French couldn't get across, so what they decided to do was fill the moat with dead horses and dead soldiers. From the other side or from their side? From the other side. Okay. So they filled the moat with dead horses and dead soldiers uh, to get across the moat. Turns out filling your water supply full of dead bodies ain't so good for uh, health. Yeah. Um, So there was disease and sickness. There was no mercy on either side. There's all these terrible stories. Um, So Acre was a port town off this coast of what is now Israel. Um, And uh, um, so there was all these terrible stories like an Egyptian boat full of of Muslim soldiers came to relieve the town. But it was captured, and I kid you not, by a boat full of Christian women who had peasant women who had come uh, to crusade. They just happened to capture this boat, <laughs> and these peasant women slaughtered all of the Ooh, Muslims. Wow. Um, on the other side, the Muslims let loose thousands of poisonous snakes into the camp of the Christians. They just like rounded up all these snakes mm-hmm. and let them loose. And so all these Christians died by poisonous snake bites. Um, they ran out of food and everyone had to eat their mules. Mm. Um, and then, uh, tough. yeah, that's tough. It's not good meat. And then, um, uh, the rumor that the, apparently the, the, um, the word that came back to Christendom to show how depraved this battle was, was that, uh, the only, the only people that were profiting were the prostitutes who worked both sides of the, uh, the Muslims and the Christians. Uh, they, they earned lots of money. Uh, going back and forth. Anyway, so Richard comes to this terrible, terrible siege that had been happening for a long time, and he's like, I'm going to break this siege. Mm. So um, he gets there, and he draws out the plans to break the siege, and then he immediately gets deathly sick. Um, And he has this terrible, terrible fever. And um, the head of the siege, the head of the Muslims, was a man by the name of Saladin. Mm -hmm. Um, He's got a very long name, which I can't remember. But he was a pretty chivalrous and noble Muslim leader. And Richard says, all right, maybe instead of breaking the siege, I can negotiate a peace. I'm a new guy. There's no bad blood between me and Saladin. Saladin and the other Christian leaders like Philip II and um, uh, all of these other – there was a guy named Leopold of Austria and all these different guys. Maybe I can negotiate and broker a peace and get this city. And he's also super sick. So he sends a letter to Saladin saying, like, let's meet and broker peace. Saladin sends a letter back saying that he's not going to. But Saladin said, I heard you're sick and not feeling very well. So he sent him uh, sherbet. He sent him, like, ices and fruit to help make him feel better. That's awesome. Uh, which is kind of odd. And this sort of started this long correspondence between oh. Richard and Saladin. They wow. would write letters back and forth even though they were locked in mortal battle with oh. one another. Do we still have those letters? Uh, I think so. I think there's, they're out there, yeah. Oh, that's cool. But apparently they developed this, like, cordial friendship. And um, there's a very nice story at the end when uh, Richard goes back to England. Um, but anyway, so Richard's sick. He asks for a meeting. Saladin says no. Um, Richard uses his military prowess, and he eventually uh, breaks the siege of Acre. Um, and in the big battle, um, he rushes in, and um, him... And Philip II and Leopold of Austria and all these other men come in and they they swamp the the city. Saladin flees. They take over the citadel. And all of the men decide to raise their flags. So Richard raises his flag, the three lions, and Philip II raises his, and Leopold raises his. And we don't really know what happened, but somehow all the other flags were taken down except for Richard's. 
So at the end of it, only Richard's flag was flying, and everyone was like, Richard took over uh, uh, Acre, uh, and he got the name Lionheart for because oh. his, his crest was lions, and, um, and he was like you know this Christian uh, uh, crusader who took over the town that nobody else could, and everyone was like, Richard, Richard, he, Richard. Woo-hoo. Even though he wasn't the only one. Even though he wasn't the only one. Leopold's pretty ticked, yeah. um, and Philip is also super ticked. Um, they kind of, Leopold and Philip kind of run out of money and go home. And Richard is quoted to have said that while Philip II was around, he was like, R- Richard said, I am like a cat with, uh, with a hammer tied to his tail. Uh, but now that Philip II is gone, he can sort of uh, you know, be free. free. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Leopold goes off ticked. Now, Leopold's going to come back in the story. But he's angry at Richard because Richard took all the glory. Philip goes back to France. Um, um, now, so th- uh, we're not going to go into all the battles of the Crusades. It's basically uh, like a cat and mouse game between Richard and Saladin. Saladin wins some battles and Richard has to retreat. Richard wins some battles and Saladin has to retreat. The Muslims are in control of Jerusalem. Richard wants to free Jerusalem. He never does. Um, and it goes back and forth and back and forth. And then news comes to Richard that there is trouble back home, that John mm-hmm. and his regents are not seeing eye to eye and they have raised armies against each other and are starting to be dirtbags towards one another. There's no open war yet, um, but it's getting that but way. But when you are raising armies, that's never a when good When you're raising sign. armies, it's not a good thing. So John has, sorry, Richard has to leave the Holy Land to go home. And in 1192, so only a year after the Siege of Acre, 1192, he writes Saladin a letter and he says, I got to go home. This has been fun, uh, but I shall return, mm. is what he tells him. And Saladin says, there, was, there is no one I would rather lose my empire to. Wow. Um, and that's kind of nice. In another life, they could have been good Best bros. Yeah. 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 That's, well, they still got to be kind of with kinda the touching. pen like, pal thing. Great. Yeah. So uh, they kind of had this, like, they respected each other as military commanders, and they basically clashed in the field of battle, and there was, it was a draw. Yeah. I, can you imagine how, if the two of them had joined forces and mm. what kind of damage yeah. they could have done to others? It's like, true. can you imagine a, a Richard and Saladin duo? That would have been... Yeah. I mean, yeah. It, and there's just... it. I, I love the story because, yes, they were locked in mortal peril. And, yes, like, the reasons behind the Crusades were real sketchy from, like, a theological point of view. Not good. Uh, not a very good history for the church. Um, but at, at least they had this... Um, that there was sort of honor among mm. commanders yeah. and that these men who uh, fought one another, uh, there was honor among them. I know, I'm, I'm reminded of um, other, uh, of like uh, uh, Montgomery and Rommel or Patton and Rommel in World War II, Rommel being the German commander, the Desert Fox, and Patton being who he was. There was respect among, you know, German and American forces, even though it was a, you know, this sort of bloody affair. I don't know. There's just something, something nice about it about the respect between these commanders. Yeah. Which... Uh, I'm not sure it was a great consolation to the men on the ground. Right? It was, and, sure. that's the, and that's the sort of the cruel irony, right? It's not yeah. a great consolation to the guys who were like, bodies filled up the moat. To- yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, there's a... They're doing... The, yeah, they're filling moats with the dead bodies of some somebody. Yeah. yeah. Um, anyway, so Richard goes back to England, ticked that his brother John and his regents are kind of like catty with one another, and they're raising armies, and they're threatening to fight. And Philip, and, then, and also Philip II is back in town, super ticked that Alice did not marry Richard, and waiting for Richard's crusade to be done, because then he's going to pounce. Mm. So um, uh, with, this, yeah, with, with Acre being taken, it's, it's kind of like a weird thing. When is your crusade over? Like, do you sort of say, now my crusade is done? Uh, oftentimes, you sort of had to claim what you planned on doing, mm-hmm. and then if you succeeded or didn't succeed, then your crusade was done. So Richard took over Acre, but he was not going to take Jerusalem, which he said he was going to do. And when everyone kind of realized that, there was this sense of, like, maybe Richard's crusade is over and he's fair mm-hmm. game again. So Richard is like, dang, I'm not going to be able to take Jerusalem. I should probably get back before Philip does something stupid like marry Alice to John or mm-hmm. something, right? Um so Richard goes back, but in order to get back, he has to travel through Leopold's mm. kingdom. Um, Leopold, who's not Leopold, happy with who's him. not happy with him, and Leopold, whose liege is the um, is Frederick Barbarossa, who is the Holy Roman Emperor. So Leopold and Frederick not happy with Richard. Leopold and Frederick 
buddies with Philip of France. Richard sort of travels home in disguise. He sends his army a different way. He travels home in disguise because he's trying to get back first. Um, some of the, you know some of the soldiers would stay in the Holy Land and and align themselves with you know they would become Templars and stay there or whatever. The army kind of gets disbanded. Richard's coming home, and he gets captured. Mm. He gets captured and sent to the Holy Roman Emperor. Um, I think Frederick Barbarossa had died by that time, and there's another guy whose name I can't remember. F- Richard is captured, and um, nobody. So people in England have no idea where Richard is. There's rumors that he's captured, but it's not like you don't you know. There's not you don't tweet it out. There's no <laughs> diplomacy. Like people are like, "Where's Richard? Our king is not coming home," and. Um, no one really knows where he is, and Richard's right-hand man, his squire, b- basically the story is is that he rode up and down the countryside just trying to find him, calling out his name, wow. searching for him, trying to find him. And then one day, and I kid you not, this is a story, um, one day uh, his squire is sitting by the road, despondent and sad, and he hears a song. He hears somebody singing in the distance. And he recognizes the song, that it was one of the songs that Richard had written. Mm. It was one of his own uh, uh, compositions. I have a translation of the words of the song uh, from what Richard said. It's originally in French, but this is the translation. No man imprisoned tells his story rightfully, as if he were not sorrowful. But for comfort, comfort, he can write a song. I have many friends, but poor are their gifts. Shame on them, if for my ransom I must be two winters imprisoned. It is well known by men and, um, and my barons, English, Norman, po- uh, Poitevin, and Gascon, that I could not have the poorest companion whom I would leave to remain in prison. I don't say this for their reproach, but still, I am imprisoned. So, so, so he's angry at the people? Who- he's angry at the people who aren't paying his ransom or anything. Right. Anyway, so his buddy hears, his squire hears a song, he's like, that's Richard. And he comes and he finds that Richard is singing the song in this tower locked away. And he's like, my lord, king, is that you? And he's like, yeah. (laughs) Anyway, (laughs) word gets back that Richard is imprisoned and uh, the Holy Roman Empire asks England for a ransom. Mm. This is where we get the term a king's ransom Mm. because it was the biggest sum of money that had ever been gathered for a ransom in like the history of anyone's memory. Mm. It was like millions and millions of gold and silver ducats then. So you imagine what the you know the exchange rate would be for today. Yeah, like it just hundreds ins- of millions of dollars. Insane amount of money. An yeah. insane amount of money. Anyway, so Richard is freed. Um, and we're he, talking like Google money. <laughs> we're talking Google money. Uh, Richard is freed after this king's ransom and basically bankrupt, bankrupts England. And he comes home. His crusade is done. He's now he kind of knows he's going to be at war with Philip the uh, second and he comes home and John um, has been a dirtbag since since Richard is gone. He sort of um, um, tax people really heavily. And this is the whole Robin Hood thing. Now, I don't know very much about Robin Hood, so I can't really fill in much of the story. But Prince John was not a very good prince. While Richard was was gone. He, you know, um, taxed everybody, kept the money for himself, did not administer justice fairly. Um, played favorites, and the whole Robin Hood story. Robin Hood, you know, stole from the rich to give to the poor. Um, this whole section, if you read, decide to read Ivanhoe, mm. this is kind of, it takes exactly. place during this exact time. Yeah. So Richard comes back basically with, like, shining his boot to beat the, to kick the crap out of his brother. And his brother comes and bows before him and begs for forgiveness. Um, and... Um, so Richard forgives him, which people were kind of mad at him for doing. And this is what Richard says to John when John, who asked for forgiveness, and John's in his mid twenties. Um, the king. This is one of the chroniclers. The king lifted up by his hand his natural brother and kissed him, saying, "John, have no fear. You are a child, and you have had bad men looking after you. Those who taught, uh, those." Uh, sorry, those who uh, thought to give you bad advice will get their desserts. Mm. Go up, go and eat. Wow. So basically he's like, the people I had around you were bad men, uh, but you're just an impressionable sort of young guy. I forgive you. And John gets off. But was that was that true? Was John not a bad dude? John was a bad dude. Oh. Uh, yes, uh, John should not have gotten off. John made these decisions himself. But Richard was just sort of, Gracious. I don't know if you want to say blinded by family, because I mean, it's his brother. Yeah. Are you going to 
like throw your brother in jail. Wait, John is, or Richard is not that, you know, the, the bonds of love sort of trumped maybe what was politically expedient, which mm. is sort of even already a fascinating thing. Like these are humans. These are people. Um, um, and their whims also sort of dictate history. Right. Um, anyway, so John kind of goes off and slinks in the background. Richard goes to basically goes to war with Philip II. He's back. There's a big old throwdown. Um, and um, there's hilarious stories about these wars. Apparently one battle went on for so long that by the time William Marshall, who was uh, Richard's uh, constable, Richard's or not his constable, his... Um, his like top knight. There was this battle and William Marshall took the city, but he was so tired and he was locked in this like fighting with the constable of the town that in order to stop the fight, Richard Marshall pushed the constable down and sat on him. <laughs> and he's like, and he's like, it's just, I gotta take a breather. So he sits on him and then the constable's like, mercy, and then the battle's over. Um, anyway. Well, I mean, a, a guy in full armor. Yeah, is, he sits that on is not heavy. Yeah, like that's like what several hundred pounds. Sure, so <laughs> not about hundred, but yeah, it's a lot of well, it's dude, heavy. dude weight, so dude, and then the like, armor for sure. Yeah. yeah, okay. Richard is married to uh, the Princess of Navarre, but they have no kids. There was rumors that Richard was not necessarily all that interested in women. There's also rumors that Richard just wasn't all that interested in affection. Anything but fights. Yeah, anything but right. fights. Um, and then there's also rumors that, you know, the Plantagenets being the spawn of Satan, God's not going to give them kids. Mm. Um, and a lot of people were super ticked that he forgave John. Mm. And he's like, all right, well, you know, God's going to... The be punishment a, be, is... Be, the punishment is no children. Yeah. Anyway, but he was still young. Um, he had, you know, his king... He basically just did his crusade as a young man. And now he's back and he's ready to rule. One day, Richard is besieging this tiny, tiny little town that has declared for Philip II. And Richard comes with, like, a, t- a small army to besiege the town. It was just an ordinary day. This was not going to be a big epic battle. Richard comes to this town, and he's uh, riding around it to sur- uh, survey the walls and, and sort of gauge how he should attack this. Should he wait it out? Should he start launching rocks? And one young French man named Peter Basilius, armed with a crossbow and a frying pan, <laughs> stands up on the walls and yells obscenities oh. to Richard, wow. King of England. And, um, and like, shakes his crossbow and shakes his frying pan. And he's <laughs> it like, sounds like Monty Python. This yeah, is where seriously. they get the thing. I'm sure this is where really? they get it from this scene. Peter Basilius yells his obscenities at the king. He's like, you've gone away, you King of England. <laughs> um, and lobs, sort of basically, like, lobs a crossbow bolt. Like, 45-degree angle in the air, poof, lobs his crossbow bolt towards the king. Shaking his frying pan. Now, it takes, you know, the king of England is, he is so impressed with Peter Basilius. He says, like, he basically comes out from, he puts his shield down oh, and no. he praises the man for his, like, audacity and his cojones wow. <laughs> for lobbing a crossbow bolt. And he's like, you've got some stones on you. I'm going to personally, like, kick the crap out of you when we get in there. <laughs> Meanwhile, as he's praising the man, the crossbow bolt just through complete chance, hits Richard in the shoulder Ugh. and lodges in there. And, he's, and, and it hurts him, obviously. He's got a crossbow bolt in his shoulder. And Peter Basilius immediately does a happy French dance because he just, <laughs> like, sniped the king of England with a crossbow bolt. <laughs> Richard, with a crossbow bolt in his arm, laughs, yeah. praises the man for his great shot, and then goes to get the crossbow bolt removed and, and stitched up. Unfortunately for Richard, it gets infected. Yeah. It gets infected, and Richard eventually dies from it. Mm. Um, and that little French man <laughs> yes. feels hero, really right? good. Yeah. That little French man. Anyway, um, so he dies by this crossbow bolt, um, and on his deathbed, Richard asks his men to forgive Peter Basilius when they take the town, which they immediately do the next day. Um, take the town. Um, um, you know, Richard wants him to be exonerated for his bravery. His men do not. The, they kill Peter not. Basilius. Yes. Well, of I know. Of course they do. He killed the king. Um, Isn't that the right thing to do? But with a, like, shaking a frying pan. I, that's the kind of man you want in your army. You don't <laughs> kill a man like that. You recruit yes. him. Good, good. So get, he died of gangrene. The, cro- turns out the crossbow bolt sunk six inches into oh. his shoulder. Oh. So oh. it was a pretty serious wound. Um, and Peter Basilius did not get let off. He was, I think he was hanged. 
or beheaded. Or, no, beheaded was for nobles. I think he was hanged, hmm. uh, or worse. Anyway. Is that really a thing, that the punishment was based on? Yes. I didn't know mm-hmm. that. It was based on rank. Huh. Um, uh, uh, peasants were hanged or tortured, and nobles were beheaded. It was huh. honorable, um, unless you had a blunt sword, which, ha- <laughs> which happened from time to time. There's a terrible like story. A times. There's a terrible story uh, of the end of the War of the Roses. The last surviving matron of the House of York is to be beheaded, and she's in her 80s. And they forgot to sharpen the sword. This is the in sword. the Tower of London, right? I think I know yeah, the story. They forgot to sharpen the sword, and it took like five or six <gasps> hits to actually kill her. And it was just like the you know it was like a fitting end for that bloody period. Anyway, um, Oof. that's anyway. So Richard is dead, and nobody knows. And there was now a succession problem. You had John, who was probably technically the successor, but everyone was like, oh, dang. (laughs) Not that guy. Not that guy. And then there was also a a 12-year-old boy named Arthur. Now, Arthur was the son of Richard's brother, Geoffrey. Okay. So Geoffrey was the guy that didn't play very much role in in the, the war of these brothers. He was the guy, if you remember, who, when his best friend died, who was the king of, Eng- uh, king of France, okay. he jumped into his grave and yeah. wept. Uh, anyway, um, Geoffrey's son, Arthur, uh, was, also, was apparently like a bright, young, handsome, thoughtful, already good at martial, uh, marshalling men as a 12-year-old. And I was like, wow. you know what? Arthur should probably be it. He is the son of the older brother to Richard, and there was definitely a case for him to be king. Um, Philip II wanted Arthur to be king when word got out. Um, uh, John wanted to be king, obviously. And so there are these two men, William Marshall and this other guy whose name was uh, uh, Hubert Walter. These were some of the regents of England. And they got together one evening, and they basically tried to figure out who was going to be king because they could basically say whatever they wanted to. Oh, Richard on his deathbed said so-and-so should be king. There was no written records. And they basically sat down as men who were concerned for their country or for their kingdom, and they said, who should we have be king? Hubert Walter wanted Arthur. He's like, John's bad dude. Um, William Marshall agreed that John was bad, but he was also had a stronger claim, mm. being the brother as opposed to the nephew. So eventually they said, all right, we'll, we'll push John's claim to be king. But uh, um, uh, Hubert Walter said this to William Marshall, you will never come to regret anything you did as much as what you're doing now wow. by having John be king. Um, so John becomes king. Um, and um, remember, he was weak, indecisive, mean-spirited. He was, quote, nature's enemy. <laughs> Um, John was not a fighting man. John becomes king and Philip II immediately declares war on, mm. on the Plantagenets, on, on England. John does not know how to marshal troops. John does not know how to fight. He lost many little battles. And, to, and basically what he wanted to do was end these wars as quickly as possible. So there was a succession of battle, losing, giving a little piece of land to Philip. Peace for a couple years. Battle, losing, giving a piece of land to Philip. Peace for a little bit. Seems like a good deal for Philip. You just keep battering. Yeah. So John gave all these concessions, and in five months, he had given up all of the land that his family had struggled to take in a hundred years. Wow. Five months, gave it all to Philip II, all the land that his that his grand his his parents and grandparents had fought to for hundred years to 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 gain Aquitaine. A big chunk of Normandy um, uh, and all these other places. Philip II, happy dude. Yeah. Um, so John received a new nickname, and his new nickname was Soft Sword. <laughs> oh. Because Black he was land a black land sword. such a soft sword. Because <laughs> he was so bad at that fighting. That is rough. So um, uh, everyone was ticked at John. He's yep. losing all this land, and John basically retreats and lives in England. So before England was seen as this, like, gravy to the empire, now the empire is gone and England's all they got left. Yeah. So the no, the, so the the UK as we have it now yes. is sort of the result of John's of failings. John's giving up all of France to Philip II. Oh, man. So John goes back to England and he's like, "All right, let's hunker down here." Philip, there was always these rumors that Philip was going to invade England, but it never really materialized. And all of the nobles hated John because he gave up all their land. John uh, had a long reign, but as it went on, he lost all of his friends and allies who were friends and allies to Richard. 
And as he lost allies, he got super paranoid and he got um, uh, uh, really uh, sort of aggravated and, and thought that everyone was coming for his throne. Um, anyway, um, and he was always super concerned that Arthur was going to take over mm -hmm. as Arthur grew. Um, one day through a series of misadventures, Arthur and his mother got um, captured by uh, some, I think he was like a Dutch nobleman and was delivered to John as a favor. Hey, I've got Arthur. So John had his rival for the throne in jail. Now, it was his nephew, so he had to treat him right. Um, but on Easter, uh, oh yeah, he sort of, and, and but this is maybe tells you a little bit what John was like. John went to the jailer of Arthur and he said, I want you to blind and castrate Arthur. Mm. Oh my gosh. And wow. the jailer said, okay, and then he didn't do it. Oh, good. Um, because he felt, he was like, I'm not doing that. Isn't there kind of a record of things like that happening when royal personages are supposed to die? Like, that happened in Troy when they were supposed to kill Paris, yep. and it happened in, uh, was it Snow White? I have no idea. Oh, yeah. One of those, yeah. yeah. Right? Uh, supposed to kill, the hunter is supposed to kill Snow White, and mm -hmm. he doesn't do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he's supposed to blind and castrate, not kill, but blind and castrate Arthur, and the jailer doesn't do it. Yeah. Easter of, I think, 1203... Um, John flies into a rage, and all of the men around him said the only explanation we have for this is that he got possessed by the devil. On, I think, I think on Easter Sunday, John went into the tower where Arthur was, murdered Arthur with his bare oh. hands, tied him to a rock, and threw him into the river. What in the world? A fisherman found him a couple of days later and gave him a Christian burial secretly so that John didn't know. Yeah. Um, Philip II basically said, we will never have peace until you, sh until you bring Arthur out of jail. Philip knew that Arthur was dead. Mm. But he's like, show oh, me that oh, Arthur's oh, alive or there's yeah. never going to be peace. And John's like, ah, oh, dang it. Um, <laughs> At this point, I kind of like Philip more right. than yeah, I like, Yeah, yeah, John. exactly. John, sure. Like, I'm not, not, I'm not sad that the kid's losing land. <laughs> so, John goes, so John is trapped in England. Philip basically runs the continent. Um, and John decides that he's going to try to rule this, the last little bit of this country that he has, which is England. He's a terrible king. He sells justice, so if you have enough money, you can get out of crimes. Um, he, uh, uh, ev everybody sort of hates him, and then one, and then um, the bishop of uh, uh, Canterbury dies, and the pope ass assigns a new bishop. So they had papal investiture. Invest. Inv I can't ever pronounce that word. Investiture. Investiture, which means that the pope decides bishops as opposed to the king. Right. So the pope chose a bishop. John did not like this bishop. John kicks out every priest and bishop out of England. Mm. Um, so it doesn't like one bishop yes, kicks them all kicks out. Them all. Um, uh, uh, when this happened, there was a lunar eclipse in 1208. Oh, oh no. man! So there was yeah, <laughs> just nothing comes up, John. Like, so it's there was, all it's all real. But bad he had news. it coming, yeah. right? Like you don't feel bad for the exactly. Guy for all this. So there was a lunar eclipse in 1208, and everyone was like, "Oh no, I think that's bad." <laughs> um, and then immediately, John kicks out all the bishops of England, and oh, the Pope. No cancels every religious activity and excommunicates John. Mm. So that meant there was no mass. If you wanted to get married, you people got married in the doorways of churches, not in churches. There was no priests to conduct the ceremonies. There were no church bells ringing, so no one knew what time it was. <laughs> there were no funerals, so that people had to be buried. Uh, there were, You were not allowed to go and do a funeral because there was no priests and bishops to do it. So people were being buried in ditches mm -hmm. with just this idea that... And no one was getting their last rites. So that nobody was, was getting their last deal. rites. The nobles were furious because uh, John basically turned the country into uh, a pagan nation. Like, mm -hmm. they, he was excommunicated. John... Hey, wait, so so mm -hmm. pause. Have you ever read A Tennessee Yankee in King Arthur's Court? No. It's a Mark Twain book mm -hmm. that nobody knows about. Mm -hmm. And it's about a, a guy from Tennessee who accidentally travels back in time somehow, and they put him in jail because he talks weird and he looks funny, and they just put people in jail a lot, mm -hmm. and they're going to kill him. And when he gets up there, he says, I'm a wizard. And because he remembered, like, he knew some stuff about, you know, astronomy and mm -hmm. the time period, and he's like, if you don't let me go, I will blot out the sun. Because <laughs> he knew an eclipse was coming. Yeah. And he, he had the right day, and then he, like, raises his arm but it ta takes a minute. So he's like, you guys just have to wait. <laughs> Give it a minute. And then it starts, and then the king is like, well, all right, we'll let you off. You, you're on our team as long as you take away this darkness. And he's like, I'm going to do it in 
35 minutes because <laughs> eclipses take a little while so he's like i will show you that i am wrathful by leaving the sun gone for some time and so they all stand in this courtyard for like half an hour it's really awkward anyway it's a really good good read if anybody out there wants to read some but, fun stuff but when you believe that the heavens are right. are give portents of god's favor or lack of favor and an fortune eclipses. then an eclipse is a big deal yeah um so we'll wrap up john and then we'll be done uh we won't go to henry the third um so um john Apparently, it turns out that excommunicating all the, or kicking all the bishops out of your country is really great for business because people still pay taxes to churches oh. or tithes to churches, but instead, because it was just part of their land taxes, and instead of it going to bishops, it went to John. Huh. So John became super flippin' rich because of all the bishops being gone, but he was excommunicated and there was no church services going on in England. The nobles were furious. John was stinking rich yeah. and he had no desire to end this kind of situation. Eventually, the, the Pope says, England's mine, and turns England into a papal state. England becomes, an, uh, becomes a sub-state of the Vatican. The King of England is now the Pope Innocent III, I think. So um, it sounds like John just sort of misunderstood the value of money versus yeah. power. Yes, like, yeah, for sure. When you have a ton of money, but all of your nobles hate you and all of your people mm -hmm. hate you, and you don't, like, what are you going to do with all that money, mm -hmm. right? So John is excommunicated, the England becomes a papal state, and Pope Innocent says, we're going to have our own, a new crusade, and we're going to go kill England. <gasps> and so Philip's like, I'm in. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and so Philip starts to build up an army, and then at this point, John's like, fine, fine, fine. He lets the bishop of Canterbury be the bishop of Canterbury the Pope chose. He gives a bunch of money. He, like, fake... Or he, you know, basically uh, uh, um, does penance to the to the Pope. The Pope says, all right, you're a Christian again. I'm going to give you your state back. And John sort of, like, pulls back from the edge, from the brink. And Philip says, rats. Yeah. <laughs> now, all of the nobles are super ticked at this, and they realize that the, the madness of one man can completely destroy our nation. And they draw up a document that they want Philip, or they, they, they want John to sign that basically says, if you do not adhere to your coronation oath, 25 nobles can overthrow the king. Yeah. And this document is called the Magna Carta. Yeah. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other things in the Magna Carta, all these minute details about justice and women can, can get married. Um, uh, to, um, well, I was going to say thank heavens. No, it's like, no, it's like, it's like um, <laughs> there, there are these sort of like marriage uh, um, stipulations that um, the king doesn't have to approve of marriages, yeah. that, that lords can get married to whoever they want, blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah, blah. And so there's basically, it was the first document between lords and king as a written down document that they both signed and both adhered to. And this was the first time that that government appealed to a higher law than just the whims of the king or the might of the sword. Mm. And that's why the Magna Carta is seen as such a big document in, in English history um, and in, in government history because it is the first time that something beyond power of an individual or power of a military or, char or character or charisma is appealed to um, for ruling the nation. Okay. Um, John lives out the rest of his life um, and uh, dies, and then his uh, nine-year-old son, Henry III, becomes king, and we'll take up Henry III. Maybe we won't do a Plantagenet part three. Why maybe, not? This is awesome. Maybe not. Maybe, like, we'll do it down the line so people, we can give people a break. I don't want um, a break from this. But so um, people in England, and this is maybe we'll end uh, with a small little conversation. People in the Middle Ages at the time viewed the, the reign of John and Richard and his father, Henry II, and all these reigns that history was this vast wheel of fortune, that there was times where you were in the sun and that there was times where you were in the darkness, in the rain, that, uh, and they actually had a cosmology about this. Fortune was, it set, was a demiurge, I think, um, or fortune was herself a, a, a being whose job it was, was every once in a while to basically stir up the waters of history so that some groups of people could have favor and some groups of people could have misfortune. And then every once in a while, that would get shifted around. So when John became king, people just would say, well, this is our time of misfortune. Um, and, and of course, God's judgment because John's a, you know, a jack wagon. Um, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> uh -huh. um, but, uh, but they just sort of had this strong view that history was this 
this sort of oscillating back and forth between favor and disfavor. And, and th- this is how they viewed history, that it was going to be this oscillating back and forth of favor and disfavor, favor and disfavor, until God, in his mercy, decided to end history. I would posit that we don't have that view of history as modern people. Our view of history would be like, well, I don't know, what do you, what, Thomas, what would you think our view of history would be? That it improves over time, things get better, progress. Yeah, right. yeah, that, um, that every step, that we sort of implicitly believe that 2020, the year 2020, should be better than this year, 2018. Yeah, well, that's and when that, Uber comes out with their flying cars. That's right, <laughs> so. and that yep. 2018 should be better than 2015 in the eyes of history, and 2015 should have been better than 1999. Like, this is sort of how we as modern people believe about history. Um and that, that probably colors a lot of what we think and do and act and do foreign policy and all sorts of stuff. And this will tie in well with what I think it may either it will be next week's episode or the week after um, about the essays from Wendell Berry, where even AJ's joke right there, like the reason the future is better is technology, right? Like yeah. the stuff we'll have in the future is better than the stuff that we have right now. And that means like all of life is better. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, but that, or that, we'll that, know more science, yeah. so therefore everything will be. Yeah, but a lot of that, I mean, that's early 20th century. That's like pre-World War One. That's pre-disillusionment with technology. Mm-hmm. It's like, man, uh, it's, um, what's that place at Disney that's the world of the future? Tomorrowland. Tomorrowland. Like that, in looking to the future, it is better because of the stuff that's developed. Um, and that's a modern concept. Yeah, this was not the view of history nope. of the Middle Ages. Nope. It was that... Um, there was actually kind of no rhyme or reason to it. If you happen to live in an era of fortune, you gave thanks to God for your good fortune. And if you happen to live in an era of misfortune, um, you kind of just had to hunker down until the wheel turned. Yeah. Um, and I, we just definitely... Or moved to France. Or moved to France. <laughs> and we just don't think that way anymore. I don't know. I just... Could people do that? I didn't even think about that. No, not really. Language the, and... Didn't you have more of a national identity of like... A, f- a Frenchman versus an Englishman versus a, there's, or not even. There's not really nations, right? Like yeah. there's, it's it's liege lords. Yeah. So you couldn't really, as a peasant, move to France because you were abandoning your liege lord, mm. who is maybe the Duke of, you know, Wessex or whatever. Actually, they didn't have that. Yeah. Um, anyway, just the idea that of, uh, it'd be interesting, maybe we don't have enough time now, but just to think about like, how does our view of history shape our um, telling of history and also shape our understanding of our time and place right now. Well, that swings in with kind of the medieval understanding of time, that it was cyclical, right? Mm-hmm. The yeah. summer that returns every year is the yeah. same summer that's been returning for ages and ages. Whereas we, I think maybe because of this, the way we view timelines in school, we see them as linear graphs. We would see time probably as a, more like a line graph, where we're sort mm-hmm. of on a slow ramp up, mm-hmm. and we're the best it's ever been, and it's only going to get better from here, yeah. rather than something on a wheel that, you know, time keeps coming back and doing the same things over and over again. And I think yeah. as modern Christians, we have a kind of a interesting or a weird tension with this, because on the one hand, we are modern people, and we probably at some level have this belief in the progress of history, yeah. that 2020 will be better. But as Christians, we also have this deeply ingrained belief that as time goes on, the sins of the world get more and more entrenched until God's wrath gets filled and history ends. So we kind of have these like two competing ideas in our mind of like secular progress and spiritual like, you know, uh, uh, downward trajectory yeah. comp- going at the same time. And I see that in our students trying to like rectify those things. You can almost see like a switch flip when they're talking about history and not thinking about faith everything's getting better and iPhones are cooler. But then when you're talking about faith, they're like, the world's terrible and it's getting worse all the time and technology is ruining our lives. Mm. And they can kind of hold these two things in tension. I don't know. It's just, yeah, the, the sort of the cogn- cognitive dissonance of competing views of history, of progress and of, and of degradation. Yeah. Yeah, I just wonder, with, with reading classics, if that helps to point that out more. Like, that great thought comes from times that are before today. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, AJ, I think you always wrapped up reading Dante. And yep. It's like, we have not had much better come out than Dante, right? And, um, I don't know. That good things, great things came from the past. Well, I But, asked but there's for... also a little bit of, his, you know, chronological snobbery going on there as well. I mean, we, there's great things coming from modern day too. It's just, I think C.S. Lewis would argue that it's harder to tell what those are without a hundred years at our back, right? We know what the great things that came out of p- previous eras are because we still have them around. We right. still value them because they're great. They speak to people across time periods. Uh, and to be able to, I don't know, you, you got to have a couple years on it before you can tell if it's a great film or not. I agree. Right? I just think it's, the difference is Dante uh, 
like it's still good now versus then as opposed to the original iPhone is a piece of junk compared to my iPhone 7 Plus. Yeah, I was thinking in terms of writing. Oh, like oh, oh. will will the Harry Potter series still speak to kids in 50 years, 60 years? Like will that still be a valuable piece of literature? Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Cool. Awesome. Um so, Sorry that we kind of nerfed the uh, the Wheel of Fortune conversation. That's okay. These stories kind of... It's okay. It's going to pop back up with Boethius anyway. Awesome. Hey! Um, yep. Hey, classical stuff we got wrong. Mm. Got an email from a listener about polytropos. Yep. Did you want to talk about that? So this is my bad. So in our podcast of Odyssey, we said polytropos. I, I posited, hey, maybe polytropos is... Maybe we can read the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts of of like a uh, with a lens of looking for the Odyssey because Polytropos pops up in in Luke Acts. It's not true. The word Polytropos pops up in the book of Hebrews, not in Luke Acts. So there's an, so there's my theory is busted. Luke Acts cannot be read as a as as like being directly influenced by the Odyssey because of the word Polytropos. Because the word Polytropos is not in Luke Acts. It is in Hebrews. Yeah. So thank you for the number of listeners who sent that in. <laughs> awesome. There was another one where we said uh, a certain text by, I think it was Aristotle was the defense of rhetoric, but it might not have been that one. true. Gorgias versus, um, it, was, it, was, it, it was a Platonic text, yeah. Platonic text. Phaedrus, um, versus. Phaedrus versus, I think it was Gorgias. Um, one, Socrates comes down real hard on rhetoric and says rhetoric's stupid. And then the other one, he actually gives a defense of rhetoric. So we made that mistake. I would also like to apologize for laughing at the name Stephen uh, last episode. I think the name Stephen is a fantastic name. I, it just struck me funny as a historical name of a king. But Eugene, you can still laugh at. You can make fun of that for sure. <laughs> you know, there might be Eugene's listening. Oh, sorry, I think Eugene, Eugene is your a fantastic name is and sorry. charming name. <clears throat> and hopefully you were not named after the Eugene that we talked about. <laughs> Yeah, um, but I think that a listener said that we got wrong, but we did not get wrong. Is that my dog is? Uh, I said that my dog is the cutest dog of all time, and that is in fact true. So <laughs> I just stand by that one. Okay, um, we are on Twitter at uh, Cliscal Stuff C L. Are we doing commonplace books, you guys? We we are forgetting that segment all the time. <sighs> hey, does anyone have any commonplace quotes that they want to go into? I think AJ does. I'd rather, I, ta- I'd rather talk about Twitter stuff. Yeah. Uh, this I like this one because there's a new season of Arrested Development coming out. Yeah, and do you remember the? Well, well, so they so they um, re- they reordered season four, right? Right. The Netflix one, and then, and then they have a season five coming yeah. out. Yeah. And do you remember the school? There's a school in that in that show that's a school where children are to be neither seen nor, neither seen nor, seen nor <laughs> yeah, heard. Sure. Yeah. Uh, here's a, a passage man. about Lycurgus, who founded the the nation of Sparta. It's from Plutarch's Lives. For Lycurgus, who ordered, as we saw, that a great piece of money should be of an, in- an inconsiderable value, on the contrary, would allow no discourse to be current, which did not contain, in few words, a great deal of useful and curious good sense. Children in Sparta, by habit of long silence, came to give just and sententious answers. For indeed, as loose as and incontinent livers are seldom fathers of many children, so loose and incontinent talkers seldom originate many sensible words. <laughs> That was really good. Okay. Any other commonplace quotes? I'm going to save one for uh, the Wendell Berry podcast. Great. Yeah. So we are on Twitter at Classical Stuff, C L S S C A L Stuff, um, at Twitter. Or wait, no, at Classical Stuff on Twitter. I'm really technologically sound. Uh, if you would like to email us with either topics or um, feedback or classical stuff we got wrong, uh, cl- we are Classical Stuff at VeritasAcademy.net. If you enjoyed this episode, would love if you would share it with a friend. That'd be really cool. Um, and I think that's everything. Have I forgotten anything? This has been a great nope. discussion. Thanks. Thanks. I appreciate it. Well, then, this is Classical Stuff You Should Know, signing off. Signing off. Bye. Thanks. Ciao.